Good morning, I'm here to talk to you about Unicraft or how to build fast specialized unikernels the easy way. Uh, Unicraft is a Linux Foundation project, part of the Zen project, and we put this together with co collaborators from the universities of Bucharest, Manchester, Lancaster, and Liège. So if you care about high performance, specialization is one really good way to achieve that. And whether you're doing it in software by building purpose-built VMs that can run runtime environments such as OCaml or JavaScript, or you care about high-performance networking with TPDK, or you're doing it in hardware with TPUs that can do ML workloads really fast, specialization is clearly one really good way to get high performance. In the virtualization space, uh, unikernels are the ways to do that. Uh, unikernels are essentially specialized virtual machines. And we'd like to achieve a number of goals with unikernels. The first one of those is that they should be easy to build and run. And this hasn't always been the case, including past projects of ours. It should be easy or even better, there should be no application porting time. And of course, they should provide great performance. We have a couple of design principles for Unicraft. The first one is that we wanted the, f the kernel to be fully modular. This is so that we could provide full software stack optimization. The second one was that we wanted to provide high performance specialized APIs as first class citizens. So for the first one, the question that comes up is why don't we just do it with Linux? To answer this question, we built a dependency graph of M M Linux's major subcomponents. An edge between two subcomponents means there's a dependency, and the number above the edge means how many dependencies. What should be clear from this graph is that it's really not that easy to take out a component. It would require a lot of engineering effort. Instead, Unicraft is built from scratch to be fully modular. This is the equivalent graphs for a Hello World application and Nginx on Unicraft. Uh, the main takeaway point here is that there's a lot fewer dependencies. So couldn't you just do it with existing unikernels? Well, most unikernel projects require a significant amount of work to get them to build. They're often non-POSIX compliant, although it do doesn't apply to all projects. And the unikernels themselves, while smaller, they're still monolithic. So Unicraft is built from scratch for these reasons, and but of course we borrowed code wherever possible. The second design principle is about providing high performance specialized APIs. Let me show you just a quick example. Imagine an application that is network bound. It's gonna link into glibc underneath, and below that we're gonna have POSIX sockets and the network stack, and eventually maybe the high performance API. Of course, this is not gonna perform very well because by the time we get to the high performance API, all these intermediate layers have slowed things down. If we cared, for instance, only about UDP, we could code against that high performance API and get high performance. Of course, this is a form of bypass, and there's been a lot of past projects doing this, but in Unicraft, these uh, bypasses are in high performance specialized APIs are first class citizens and it's fairly simple and it, requ it requires little modifications to the application to code against those. Okay, so this is uh, Unicraft's main uh, diagram, architecture diagram. We have the application at the top. We support uh, Muscle and Nulib for the libcs. Under that, there's a POSIX compatibility layer, and I'll say a few words about that later. And under that, there's the core of Unicraft. And the black boxes you see here are the specialized APIs. For instance, if we look at the uh, networking subcomponents, as in the example, we could code against our high-performance UK NetDev uh, network uh, API if we wanted to extract the best networking performance out of our application. Likewise, we could essentially bypass VFS if we care about uh, retrieving, for instance, files very quickly and code a specialized file system. And I'll show an example of that later on. We could even toy with plugging and playing different memory allocators or even running concurrent memory allocators. And I'll show an example of that later as well. So getting back to our goals, the first one was that it should be easy to build and run. And there's no easier way to show this than an actual demo. For this one, we're going to use the craft tool, which runs around, wraps around Unicraft. So we're going to say craft 
up and we're going to choose nginx as the application at staging and we're called we're going to call our unikernel my nginx unikernel and craft the first thing it's going to do is fetch all the sources it needs to build and it's going to start building immediately when it's done building it's going to actually launch the vm in this case it's going to use uh, kvm and there it is it's up and running and to make sure that it's actually working, we're going to run curl to get a little website once. And there it is. Let's do it a second time and maybe a third time to make sure everything works. So there you go. One command and you have your unikernel up and running with Nginx. So it should be pretty simple. The second goal is that there should be hopefully no application porting. That's the ideal case. Some projects attempted to do this uh, through what's called binary compatibility. You basically take an unmodified ELF and you put it on top of the unikernel and then the unikernel traps uh, syscalls. The basic problem there is that the syscall, system call cost is significantly higher than a function call cost. Instead, what we do is auto porting from source. What we do is we take the application's native build system, for instance, the one from SQLite, and we generate standard object and archive files. We then take those and directly link them into Unicraft's build system. Unicraft has a ported version of Muscle. Muscle, of course, expects Linux underneath, so it's going to try to do some syscalls. So we have a syscall shim layer to deal with those. And under that, syscall implementations. Under those, of course, instead of Linux, we have Unicraft. Just to test that this actually works in terms of compilation, we took a number of uh, libraries that we manually ported and we w figured out that essentially uh, we can compile all of them through this approach using Muscle. What about system call support? So far, we support about 140 syscalls. If you compare that against Linux, which has in the order of 350, you might think, well, we don't support that many in the end. As it turns out, uh, if you look at a paper from Eurosys in 2016, you don't need that many syscalls to support a significant number of applications. In that case, if you look at 145 syscalls, that roughly equates to about 50% applications. Of course, it matters which 145 uh, syscalls. So we did a more detailed analysis. Here, what we did is we took the top 30 Debian Popcorn most popular server apps. We're plotting them here in the x-axis. There's things like Apache uh, Web Server and SQLite. On the y-axis, we have the number of system calls that we support in terms of percentages. And we're going to plot in green how many we actually support. And the takeaway from this graph is that it's mostly green. So this means we already support a number of applications and we're pretty close to supporting uh, an, an increasing number of additional ones. And we're obviously constantly working towards that goal. In case this doesn't work, you can always go back to manual porting, which is the way we did things in the beginning of the project, especially. So we wanted to measure how expensive it is this uh, to do this uh, in the beginning of the project versus uh, now. So we did a survey of about 30 developers and over time, and we asked them to, to try to estimate how long, how much porting time it took to do uh, manual port. And we split that into how much time it took to do the actual porting of the application or library or how much time they had to spend on a side project to cope with the fact that there was a missing library dependency, an OS uh, dependency, or the build system needed modifications. I'm not really going to go into the details of this, but the main takeaway is that the trend is significantly going down. Uh, as you can see, as Unicraft matured, it becomes easier and cheaper to actually port something. Just to give you a little taste, Unicraft supports a number of language uh, environments such as uh, Python and Go, applications such as N Nginx and SQLite, and frameworks like DPDK and TensorFlow Lite. In terms of great performance, the first thing we will know is whether autoporting sacrifices performance. To answer this question, we do a little test with SQLite where we compare our manual ports of SQLite versus the order ported version. We're going to do 60,000 insertions, and we're going to measure the time it takes to do that. As a baseline, we're going to use Linux, which takes about one second. 
The next two bars show our manually ported versions on top of new live and muscle, which takes about one second as well. The most important bar though is this one. This is the order ported one on muscle and it takes just about the same time as Linux. So order porting doesn't negatively affect performance, which is a good thing. So now let's try to do some performance measurements about the gains you get when you can auto port things to Unicraft. The first one is image sizes. Uh, we have a number of different OSs and projects at the bottom and we have the image size in megabytes on the y-axis. Uh, we measure this for a few different applications, Nginx, Redis and SQLite. And basically uh, Unicraft, uh, the image sizes are in the range of uh, one to two megs. In terms of boot times, uh, we have the here the boot time on the y-axis on the x-axis, we have a few different VMMs, Kimu, Kimu with one NIC, Kimu with MicroVM, which is the faster version of Kimu, and then Solify and, Fi and Firecracker. We split the measurement between the time it takes for the VMM to boot and the time that it takes the actual guest to boot. And just to show you a few points, uh, Kimu takes about 40 milliseconds. We do take a hit when we have to have a virtual device. Micro VM in Kimo is much faster, about 9 milliseconds, but the fastest are Solo 5 and Firecracker, which clock in, in at about 3 milliseconds. Minimum memory requirements. Uh, how much memory do you need to run applications? Uh, we have uh, memory on the y-axis in terms of megabytes, and again, a number of operating system and projects on the x-axis. We used to, once again, Nginx Redis and SQLite for measure. And you can see Unicraft takes somewhere in the range for, of uh, 5 to 7 megabytes. Uh, Lupine, which is a Linux-based unit kernel, takes about 20 megabytes. And Alpine Linux takes about 30 me megabytes. Nginx throughput. Uh, on the y-axis, we have throughput in terms of thousands of requests per second. And again, a number of projects and OSs. Just to pick a few points, uh, Linux on KVM is about 100,000 100, requests per second. Linux bare metal, so not in AVM, is about 175. The Lupine Unikernel Linux uh, project takes about 189,000 and uh, Unicraft is in the range of about 292,000 requests per second. Redis performance, this time, once again, million of requests per second for both get and set for a number of different projects. And the main takeaway here is that we just about edge out uh, Linux bare metal. What about boot times when you're using different memory allocators? If you cared about really fast boot times, well, it turns out the memory allocator you use for the uh, boot code actually matters. You probably shouldn't use our standard binary body allocator. That's kind of slow. But if you're willing to write a, a simple but specialized uh, boot allocator, you can shave the boot time of the guest down to half a millisecond. Allocator perf also affects the performance of actual applications. So here we use Redis throughput uh, for four different memory allocators uh, for both get and set and the takeaway messages. In this case, you should use memaloc for this particular application because it does improve the performance of Redis. Finally, let me give you a little taste of uh, specialized APIs. Um, Imagine in this case that we're operating in the area of file systems. We want to retrieve uh, static files as quickly as possible. And for that, we're willing to code a specialized uh, file system. That file system we call SHFS and is based on a hash table. We're going to compare Unicraft against Linux and we're going to measure in terms of cycles how long it takes to retrieve a file that exists and one that doesn't. As a baseline, uh, Linux uh, VFS takes about 4,000 cycles if the file is not there and about 2,000 if it is. If we disable mitigations, because that affects performance, uh, that goes to about 3,000 and 2,000. Then on the Unicraft side, if we go through our VFS uh, system, uh, we get about 2,000 and 1,600, which is about half roughly what the Linux VFS does. But the most interesting bar is when we use SHFS, we bypass VFS and we use a custom uh, file system. And perhaps unsurprisingly, then we get an order of magnitude better performance. 
So we believe with Unicraft that high performance POSIX unikernels are now a reality. So if you're interested in getting more information, please go to unicraft.org. As I mentioned, we are a Linux Foundation open source project, so all the code is on github.com. And we have the three Eurosys reproducibility badges and a different repo. So please don't take our word for it, run it, and please let us know what you think. Thank you very much.